Hi, I'm Pam, and I'm here to talk about video games. Today, I'm talking about one of the most difficult video games I've ever played. It's Eterna Noctis. Eterna Noctis was developed by Eternum Game Studios and released at the end of 2021. It is a challenging and lengthy Metroidvania. It's currently available on Xbox consoles, PC, and PS5, though Switch and PS4 versions are planned to release soon. I played and recorded all the footage on an Xbox Series X for this review, and the code was provided to me by the developers. You play the King of Darkness, destined to be forever at war with the Queen of Light. Last time you faced off, she won. Now, you've lost your powers, because that's what needs to happen to have ability progression in the game. You must fight your way through 16 different areas to get strong enough to take on the Queen again. Eterna Noctis is a big game. It took me over 70 hours to complete it. It has a gigantic map and is filled to the brim with upgrades, quests, and collectibles. What made it take so long, though, was the challenge. The platforming you'll be faced with is on par with the endgame content of Hollow Knight, the chase sequences in the Ori games, and more straightforward and punishing platformers like Celeste or Super Meat Boy. This level of challenge is maintained through most of the game, there's very little respite. I hope you like spikes. When I Turn in Noctis initially came out, there was just one game mode, but a patch was very quickly released that introduced a second mode that decreased the platforming difficulty substantially. Difficulty mode can be changed back and forth at any point during the game, which is great, though most achievements cannot be obtained on the easier mode, which is not so great. I played through this game on the original, more difficult Noctis mode, so this review will be specific to that. I did film some comparisons of the two different modes just so I could see the difference, and I'll show you those, but I can't offer a comprehensive review of Eterna mode. As you start the game, the first thing that stands out is the art style. You're presented with an opening that shows off the beautiful stained glass theming of the game and its interface, and then get a cutscene with hand-drawn and animated characters. You fall from heaven to the opening area, a very bare-bones hub where you'll be able to visit some key characters. And don't worry, the areas won't all be dark and gloomy like this, there's quite a lot of variation to be found. Within the first 30 minutes or so, you'll have a good base of abilities like jumping, dashing, swinging your sword in any direction, and pogoing off enemies. You'll also have the ability to pick up single-use health potions that can drop from defeated foes, open fast travel points in the form of thrones, and buy dimensional vials which will return you to the last throne you visited. I did find the controls and movement took a little while to settle into. Sometimes it was difficult to get the height of my jump right. The dash sometimes seems to go a bit too far, and while you can press in the opposite direction to stop it, that was a bit awkward. Dash also has an internal cooldown, which isn't all that intuitive, and I sometimes found I had to wait a second before I could dash again. The initial combat definitely feels like it's missing something, especially with enemies who can block your attacks or leave pools of poison when they die, resulting in a lot of running in and out in order to hit them. It's not until you get the ability to shoot arrows that I found the combat really started to come into its own. This is honestly pretty common for Metroidvanias. I find they often don't start really clicking until you get a certain ability or start leveling up. This game in particular has a very long progression of abilities to uncover, as well as multiple ways to customize your character to fit your preferred playstyle. A brief look at the progress screen will show you just how much there is to find here. There are seven different skills, like your dash or the ability to collect blood and use it to heal yourself. There are six weapons. Though your sword will be your most used, others will consume blood to do a stronger axe attack or maybe a ranged shuriken attack. There are damage arrows and teleport arrows, each of which can be upgraded. You can also open up to six gem slots on your armor. Gems are hidden throughout the world and can have simple effects like increasing your weapon damage or can change the way certain abilities work. 
Plus, as you're defeating enemies and completing quests, you're gaining experience, which gives you talent points to invest in one of three trees. You can respec your character as many times as you like, as long as you're at a throne, with no drawback or cost. I think this is a fantastic feature, which really encourages you to make the most of the talent tree, depending on the circumstances you're in. There really are an incredible amount of things to get in this game. Whether it's to make your character stronger and more agile, or just fill out your collectibles list. Collecting musical scores, stained glass fragments, and keys to challenges are not just collectibles for their own sake, but reward you with useful items and abilities. For a good portion of the game, I was quite compelled to explore every nook and cranny, because most of them are likely to have something you want. But let's get on to what makes this game special, the platforming challenge. If you often find yourself thinking, wow, I love Hollow Knight, but it's just so easy, this might be the game for you. However, if just watching the footage I'm about to show you makes your blood pressure spike, then maybe skip this one. Or try Eterno Mode. It doesn't take long for the game to start providing a good amount of challenge. Very early dungeons feature sharp, spinny, moving obstacles and force you to perfectly time your jumps and dashes or be killed. Spikes, whether it's ones that line the ground so you can't touch it or which pop out when you land on platforms, are a frequent occurrence. When you get to the Tower of Light, the place that houses the first of seven fragments you need to collect as your main objective in the game, things get a little more intense. The place is swarming with enemies who get in your way while you jump between tiny platforms. There are bounce orbs to pogo from, teleporters which you need to figure out the pattern of, and all the while there's a giant pulsating energy thing which will kill you if you're too close to it when it explodes. The run-up to the boss of this area challenges you to all of the above except it adds a timing element. Take too long, you die. This is all kind of a lot. It's extremely challenging, but it's also really fun. However, in the words of fellow Canadian Randy Bachman, baby, you just ain't seen nothing yet. The teleport arrow is where the game goes from challenging to sadistic. As you've been running around, you'd notice areas of white light which kills you if you touch it. However, the teleport arrows can travel through these and you can warp to the arrow. Of course, it's rarely as easy as teleporting through one dangerous area. You'll have to shoot one arrow through a passage too small for you, another through the deadly light, and a third to boost you up high enough to get on the next platform. There is a time slow effect around aiming and shooting, but some segments will require many attempts to get it right. Thankfully, respawns when you touch something you shouldn't are immediate and they are close. Landing on spikes or something like that will make you lose one health and put you right back at the last safe area you can stand on, so you can die again. I mean, try again. These teleport arrows are a blessing and a curse. At first, I was convinced I would never get the hang of them and I'd have to abandon the game. The first area that really required use of them took me forever to get through. But there is definitely a sense of accomplishment in starting to get comfortable with them and getting through areas that initially looked impossible. They also do wonders for your agility. It's incredibly fun to use them to boost yourself way up high in the air or let you travel incredibly fast through open areas. These arrows also open up so many possibilities for boss fights. The first couple bosses, before you get access to them, are decent. They all force you to be highly mobile and are just as much about platforming and avoiding damage as they are about doing damage yourself. But then you get the arrows. This lets you do damage from range, then with a flick of the right bumper, switch and shoot a teleport arrow through two projectiles and warp to the other side. It's a lot to keep track of, the shared ammo and recharging of arrows, switching between them, but it feels really good when you pull it off and it gives the bosses so many devious ways to try to kill you. When it comes to Eterna Mode, the devs have said that the bosses have the same abilities, they just have a little less health. It's really the platforming where the big differences come in. 
Here are some comparisons of the two modes. While in Noctis, a platforming section might be covered in spikes or platforms that break after you stand on them for a second, in Eterna mode, there are less spikes and the platforms are solid. Eterna mode might also change bounce orbs to solid platforms that make things much less stressful. And the light sections, which require use of the teleport arrow, are often absent when other platforming challenges are present. Again, I can't give a comprehensive review of this mode, but it is significantly easier. A way to make the game more like other Metroidvanias, which more equally balance platforming, combat, and exploration. I would also venture to guess that completion time in this mode would be about half that of Noctis mode. A big part of what I look for in a Metroidvania is a world that's fun to explore and really get to know, as well as a great representation of that world in the in-game map. In this aspect, I turn a Noctis is a bit of a mixed bag. It's a dungeon-style map. While there are places where things interconnect and you can access areas from different directions and open shortcuts, it is one big long straightaway of a map with areas branching off it. It's rather sprawling and hard to get a good sense of the area overall. When you first start the game, an arrow points you to your main objective. It takes 8 seconds in the in-menu map to scroll from where you start to that waypoint. I assumed it was a bug when I first saw this, but no, your first goal is really that far away. This brings me to my biggest complaint about the game. It's just too damn big. There's too much of it. I'm sure some people watching are thrilled about the idea of a Metroidvania that takes 80 hours to complete, but after around 40 very difficult hours, I found myself hoping it would be over soon, and there was still so much to go. My personal enjoyment waxed and waned with the quality of the areas. There were a few real standouts, but also some that tested my patience, and some that did both. The Enigma area is beautiful and ornate. It includes some of the most interesting puzzles of the whole game, which test your brain and your reflexes. But it's also a bit of a maze in terms of where the exit from each room will take you, and the in-game map doesn't help you. The Undersea Fortress is a place I really disliked due to its layout. There's an elevator in the middle of the zone. When I first stepped out onto level 2, I had to choose which direction to go first. I chose right, got all the way to the end, then found a wall blocking my path. The switch to open it was on the opposite side of the level, meaning I was faced with backtracking through the incredibly difficult platforming sections I had just done. This punishment for choosing the wrong direction happened a couple times here. This is where I decided to stop trying to collect everything and just make a beeline towards the end. Thankfully, an area not too long after this ended up making my enjoyment of the game, and how much it impressed me, skyrocket. The Cosmos. This area really switches things up, as it lets you jump from planet to planet out in the blackness of space. You have to deal with gravity, which can change directional controls. It can propel you to danger or pull you to safety. This place is gorgeous, super challenging, but so fun. Each area in the cosmos is based around a different element. Slippery ice, fire which threatens to engulf you, light you need to teleport through, or darkness that blocks your arrows. I died a lot, but I was compelled to master each section and see what was next. The fact that it ended with a chase sequence was just the icing on the cake. I love those. I felt revived by this area. Though I do think a couple areas could have been left out to make the game stronger overall, I have to compliment how much the gameplay evolves as you go. It's constantly testing how much you've learned and your ability to adapt to new mechanics. Challenges which first seem insurmountable soon become second nature, as each new ability builds upon and enhances the rest. I do have some complaints about some specific design decisions. Shocking, I'm sure. I have one plea to make to any new Metroidvania developer. Stop trying to emulate Hollow Knight. It's a masterpiece of a game, but some aspects of it just don't need to be copied. There are two things in particular. First is the way the map revealing is done. Until you find the vendor in each zone and purchase the ability to map, it will be a blurry, unreadable mess. 
The map here is more straightforward than Hollow Knight's, and it will retroactively map, so it didn't stress me out quite as much. But in some zones, I didn't find the vendor until near the end, and it's just annoying to see nothing when I open up the map. The bigger issue is dropping your soul when you die. I can't describe how sick I am of this mechanic, or how uninteresting it has become within the genre. When you run out of health, you respawn back at the last checkpoint. Your soul drops where you died, along with all of the experience you've collected. But it goes a step further. While you don't have your soul, you also can't collect any new experience. Often you have to backtrack through very difficult areas to get back to your soul. If you don't want to do that, you can buy it back from a vendor in town, but it costs a lot, and you don't get back any of the experience you dropped. The game is immensely challenging on its own, and this punishment just feels like overkill. There are also some smaller things that I wouldn't be surprised to see a patch for at some point. You can't use the D-pad for movement, which I will always complain about in a 2D game. You wouldn't want to use it for arrow aiming, but much of the game is just straightforward platforming where the D-pad would be much more precise if you had the choice. There are no ways to remap controls either or even a way to remind yourself of what they are. The progress page shows you icons for abilities you've gained, but it doesn't name them, describe them, or tell you how to activate them. There are a few areas where the lighting effects are a bit much. In the brighter areas like the Forge or Tower of Light, everything is very glowy. It can be tiring on the eyes and make some platforms difficult to see. That said, the game is otherwise quite beautiful. Some areas are truly unique from any other games I've played. I love seeing huge creatures floating by in the background. Coming out of a dark area to find yourself against an ocean at sunset is quite spectacular, and areas like the end of the world and the cosmos are just breathtaking. The way it alternates between areas that are dark and gloomy and bright and exciting while always maintaining a cohesive world is wonderful. The game's classical score has both melancholy piano riffs which will stick in your head along with epic choral arrangements. You'll even be collecting musical scores in-game and get to play them if you can find them. Eterna Noctis is a beautiful, complicated, difficult game. The gameplay grows and evolves as you progress, meaning things never get boring and you're constantly being challenged. While I have my issues with it, and I do think it overstays its welcome, I have to admit that when I finally beat it, I felt pretty hardcore. If you're looking for a game with a lot of meaningful collectibles to find, a huge gorgeous world to explore, and above all a challenge, I turn to Noctis might just be for you. If you want to see more, check out my review of Ender Lilies, or another of my videos. I have a Patreon if you want to support the channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.